Got it. And then I need to let all the participants in. It's probably better to keep everybody muted, isn't it, for feedback? Yeah, it is going to be weird. Okay. All right, it's straight up 7 o'clock, everybody. Welcome to speaker presentation. This is going to be a great night. Dr. Sina McCullough is joining us, and I appreciate you all joining us as well. Um, this is a book that she is going to be talking to us about, and what I love about her story is that she took an issue that we are all familiar with as CSG students, and she turned it into an uh, incredible book that people can benefit from and learn from each and every day as they bring the eating habits she's recommending into their home. And you can do right away and implement. It's not a big learning curve, which I've read a few books in the past that they seem too complex. This, I assure you, is not that way, but it is completely backed with uh, brilliant science. I, um, I'm going to encourage everybody to stay muted this evening for feedback issues through the, um, everybody's computer microphones, we, we sometimes get some feedback. But we want to honor all your questions. So there is a chat feature everybody should be able to see. And you can type your question into that chat bar. And as Dr. McCullough is speaking, I'll be monitoring the chat feature to make sure your questions are answered. She will open the presentation to Q&A as she concludes, and you should be able to follow along as she takes over the presentation. Later on tonight, we are going to be uh, putting up on the slide, you can see it on your screen hopefully, uh, how to order the book, so don't don't panic, you can certainly link to it. And I'm also gonna tell you how you can support CSG while you're purchasing your book through amazon.com. So we're gonna get started and I am going to welcome Dr. Sina McCullough. And Dr. Sina, you should be getting this right now, ability to share your screen. Okay. Um, it's showing you still have it. Still not coming up? No, you still have it. Oh, now how do I do it? Here? all right okay you you're up we see you okay wonderful thank you so much and um, I want to especially thank CSG for having me tonight um, I appreciate this opportunity um, tonight I plan on sharing um, a little bit about my journey my story and then I'm going to cover briefly cover five major areas of our food supply that I feel are corrupted and then we're gonna learn to harness our power and um, tackle how we can solve this corruption and the problem with our food supply. So today, oh, it's not, hold on once, oh, there it goes, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I feel especially blessed to be with you today. Um, my life right now, is I'm a very active homeschooling mom. I actually have the ability now to um, hike with my dogs like an hour at a time. I can lift my three-year-old. Um, I have a lot of energy, but my life looked very different just 16 months ago. 
I spent most of my time lying on the floor in pain. I was too weak to even walk up the stairs without getting winded. Too weak to stand long enough to even finish doing the dishes after lunch. And I was actually in too much pain to even be able to wrap my hand around a cup. And the craziest part about that entire situation is that I have a doctoral degree in nutrition, so I'm technically supposed to be an expert in food, but I got debilitatingly sick from eating food. And now my sickness didn't happen overnight. It took over 20 years. It started with gastrointestinal issues. Within about 20 minutes of eating, I would sometimes look like I was five months pregnant. And there wasn't, it didn't seem that there was any rhyme or reason. One, one day I could eat pizza from Domino's and I was seemingly okay. And then the next week I can order the same pizza from Domino's and I had severe bloating and cramps. Um, I saw a medical doctor early on and they diagnosed me with IBS or irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, which we all probably know now as the catch-all group. And the doctor wanted me to take a prescription drug called Tagamet every time before I ate. I was only 20 years old, and I just refused to be addicted to drugs in order to be able to eat. So I continued to see more doctors, one specialist after the next. I had many, many tests done. I had three colonoscopies, two sigmoidoscopies, breath tests, urine tests, fecal tests, blood tests, and even exploratory surgery at one point. And nobody had any answers. So my husband and I became co-detectives. We ended up scouring the scientific literature looking for clues, and we theorized that I had developed a condition called leaky gut, and we thought I developed leaky gut from eating chemicals in our food supply like pesticides, synthetic additives, GMOs, and gluten. So I switched to gluten-free foods and mostly organic foods, and my symptoms did get better for a while, but then they came back and they actually got worse. So over time, over about a 20 year time span, in addition to the GI symptoms, I began to experience brain fog, nausea, chronic sinus infections, delayed recoveries from colds, um, and a tumor started to grow on the white or the sclera of my eye. And these eye specialists had no idea what the etiology was, but they could tell me that the tumor was going to continue to grow over my eye until it blinded me. Um, I also had um, five miscarriages, and the whole time, nobody knew what was wrong. Nobody could get, give me any answers. I knew it was related to diet because I had symptoms shortly after I would eat a meal, but the medical doctors didn't believe me. And in fact, towards the end of my experience with a specialist, they began to tell me that they thought that the symptoms might be in my head. So at that point, I knew I was on my own, that if I wanted to get better, I was going to have to solve my own problem. So I started a strict diet elimination reintroduction protocol. And after about two years, I had created my own list of do not eat foods. It was a very short list, but I was just grateful to have found foods that I could eat that didn't cause this, the GI symptoms. So my list became my lifeline. Now, unfortunately, it didn't take long before that list began to fail me. My body began to reject items on that list like apples and bananas. So I changed it up. I changed my approach and I started the GAPS diet, which is a gut healing diet that uses bone broths um, as a basis for healing. So that was the first time I learned how to make bone broth. And it kind of disgusted me because I was, I was brought up on that low fat craze. Um, I was taught that fat was bad. So to think that I was going to drink this broth with fat was really gross to me. But um, surprisingly, I drank the fat and my body loved it. I began to regain some energy and my bloating began to decrease. Now, unfortunately, the victory was short-lived. More foods began to turn against me. So then I tried the candida diet because I knew that yeast could be a cause for leaky gut. Um, and that actually worked really well. Before I started the diet, I, was, I tested positive for six major strains of yeast. And after the candida diet, I was negative for all strains of yeast. However, my GI symptoms did not improve. In fact, I began rejecting even the bone broths 
and I was cooking everything from scratch and I was eating everything organic. I never went out to eat, but a new symptom appeared. It was low grade muscle pain throughout my entire body. And I knew it wasn't from an injury because it was constant and it moved to different parts of my body. And it was accompanied by extreme fatigue. And at this point, the list of foods that I could eat dwindled down to about a half a sheet of paper. And this is when I hit my tipping point. It was about 16 months ago and I got the flu. My entire family actually got the flu, but I was the only one that ended up in the ER. I had very low blood pressure and I was dehydrated and I just spiraled downhill from there. And that's when I reached that point where I couldn't wrap my hand around a cup or walk upstairs without getting winded. I couldn't even sit up long enough to have lunch with my children. It became difficult to breathe. My ribs were hurting and my teeth hurt. When I would eat, it would feel like my teeth were going to fall out. And that's when I had started the process of muscle wasting, which is similar to what cancer patients experience. I lost 15 pounds in a month. And this, this was not the good kind of weight where you're excited that you reached your New Year's resolution. <laughs> I was eating almost constantly and I could not stop the weight loss. And this was the first time in 20 years of searching for answers that I was scared. I knew that if I would continue on that path that I was going to die. So that's when I surrendered to God and he, he saved me. He brought me to a functional medicine doctor named Dr. Osborne. And within the first five minutes of talking with Dr. Osborne, he did something that no specialist could do in over 20 years. He accurately diagnosed me. Now we ran tests to confirm the diagnosis, and it turns out that I had an active advanced stage of an autoimmune disease. I had arsenic poisoning from eating rice, and I had deficiencies in 15 nutrients. In fact, I was actually borderline for both pellagra and beriberi, which those are two diseases that were essentially eradicated in the United States by the early to mid 1900s. Now, what happened to me might sound a little crazy, but unfortunately, it's becoming common in America today. Adults are just getting sicker. I bet each one of us knows somebody, either a family member or a close friend, that has a chronic illness like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, or Alzheimer's, or an autoimmune disease. Because the statistics show that at least half of all adults in America have at least one chronic illness. One in three of us are obese, and every minute one of us dies from a heart-related issue. Now these chronic illnesses not only decrease the quality of your life, as evidenced through my story, but they can shorten your lifespan. For instance, diabetics are predicted to live 13 years less than non-diabetics. And obese individuals are, can live anywhere from five to 20 years less than non-obese individuals. And it's not just our adults that are getting sicker. Our children are getting sicker too. Chronic illnesses in children have quadrupled since the 1960s. And in fact, children today 25% of them already have a chronic disease. Among five and 10 year olds in a recent study, they showed that 60% of five and 10 year olds had at least one risk factor for heart disease. And 20% of those children had two or more risk factors already. And allergies are on the rise. I can't go to a daycare or a school or a Sunday school class without seeing an allergy alert posted on the wall. And the new stat that has recently come out is that it's estimated by around 2026, half of all children will have autism. It used to be that we predicted half of all boys would have autism, but now we're predicting half of all children will have autism. And the scariest statistic for me is that for the first time in the history of our nation, Children are predicted to die at an earlier age than their parents. So why? Why are our families getting sicker? Well, if you look through the scientific literature, you'll see associations between things like more chemicals in our environment, radiation exposure, and stress, all contributing to um, us getting sicker. And those could very well be contributors. 
But what else has changed in the last 60 years? Well, our diet has changed. A recent study from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, cited that evidence gleaned over the past three decades now indicates that virtually all so-called diseases of civilization, these are the chronic diseases, they all have multifactorial dietary elements that underline their etiology. So what does that mean? That means our food is killing us. In fact, the study goes on to say that diet-related diseases are the single largest cause of death in the United States. That means food is the single largest, largest cause of death in America. And now, that may sound shocking, but I think that is fabulous news. Because that means that if diet is the primary cause of death, we can save lives simply by changing our diet. I mean, think about that for a moment. Food has the power to kill us. Clearly, food can kill us. But food also has the power to heal us. So what's wrong with our food supply? Why is our food supply making us sicker? Well, one leading theory is that our food supply is inflaming our bodies. In fact, it's theorized that we've become what they're, re what they're referring to as an inflammation nation, especially a nation of individuals walking around in a state of inflammation. So let's define what type of inflammation we're talking about. We're not talking about acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is good. It's protective. So, for instance, when you stub your toe or you get a bruise or you cut your finger, that that is when your body's immune system reacts and it, it will initiate an acute inflammatory response and it helps you heal. It's like housekeepers that come out and they get rid of the dead cells to make room for the new healthy cells. What we're talking about is chronic inflammation. Now chronic meaning over an extended period of time. The inflammation constantly exists at a low level and you might not be even aware of it. And at some point, you'll reach a tipping point, and that's when it will develop into a full-blown disease. So how does that happen? How does the inflammation lead to disease? Well, a prominent theory is leaky gut, which is what I had. So we all have a single layer of cells that lines most of our gastrointestinal tract. That's one layer of cells separates us from our environment. PowerPoint. Um, now, those cells are held together by what are called tight junctions. You're a scientist, CSG student. And there are different stressors right against her uh, or different triggers that can actually disrupt those tight junctions. One of those triggers is yeah. um, food particles. So in my condition, in my situation, grain was a big trigger for me. So every time that I ate grain, it would cause a disruption of these tight junctions. And when that happened, it's like there's a gap between them and food particles and toxins like bacteria and viruses that are not supposed to get into your body, they can actually leak through and get into your body. When that happens, one thing, one result could be food intolerances. And this is one reason why we think we're seeing more allergies in children. Is, is through this mechanism of leaky gut. But in addition to the food allergies, it can also lead to autoimmune conditions. It can affect you anywhere in your body. What we think happens is that it will affect you where you are genetically weakest. So in my case, I was genetically weakest at my joints. So it attacked my joints and I developed an advanced stage of rheumatoid arthritis. If your weak link is your pancreas, it can attack your pancreas and you can develop diabetes. Or if your weak link is your brain, you can develop MS or ADHD or depression. So this is one major mechanism of how we think food is leading to disease. The food causes leaky gut, leaky gut can lead to inflammation, and chronic inflammation can lead to disease. And now that makes sense, because as we've gotten sicker over the past 60 years, our food supply has dramatically changed. So I'm going to quickly go over five major areas of our food supply that have changed. Um, I talk in more detail about these five areas in the book. So right now I'm just going to touch on them. The first dramatic change in our food supply is the increased use of pesticides and herbicides. 
Now in 1952, up to about 10% of our corn was treated with um, pesticides. By 1980, up to 99% of the corn crops were treated with pesticides. Of all the pesticides that we use, the herbicides that we use, Roundup is the most widely used weed killer in the world. It's, I'm sure you've probably heard of Roundup. People spray it on their lawns and in their gardens, but it's also sprayed on the crops that you and I eat. For example, it's used to control weeds and pest growth during the growing season, but this was something I didn't know um, before I launched this investigation into our food supply. Glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is also commonly used on certain crops like corn and wheat just before they're harvested. And that way it kills the plants uh, more uniformly. It makes it easier to harvest them. In fact, Roundup is used so extensively that a recent study found glyphosate, that active ingredient in Roundup, so they found glyphosate in 75% of air and rain samples. Now, the reality is that most of us eat glyphosate every day without even realizing it. In fact, it's estimated that 93% of Americans have glyphosate in their bodies, with children having the highest level, according to a 2015 study out of UC San Francisco. So this is a huge change in our food supply that has occurred in the past 60 years. But is it bad? Is that change bad? Is having glyphosate in your body dangerous? Well, the answer is pretty controversial at this point. Monsanto, who's the maker of Roundup, says that glyphosate is safe. The EPA, some lobbyists, and science, some scientists all agree with Monsanto, and they think the glyphosate is, is safe at certain levels. But there's other scientists and organizations that disagree. For example, the World Health Organization in 2015 declared glyphosate to be probably carcinogenic to humans. That means it probably causes cancer. In addition, research is now coming out in peer-reviewed scientific journals that's indicating that glyphosate may actually contribute to leaky gut formation. Now, I've looked at the research and personally I agree that glyphosate may be dangerous when we're exposed to it over time. So I try to limit my exposure whenever possible. Now, I realize that my stance on glyphosate is in direct opposition to the EPA, but the EPA may not be impartial when it comes to glyphosate. Right now, there's a court case going on against Monsanto by people claiming to have developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from glyphosate exposure. And that case is now in federal court. Just last month, in that court case, emails between Monsanto and federal regulators, including regulators at the EPA, were revealed in court. Those documents showed that the lead toxicologist for Monsanto stated in her deposition that Monsanto has never conducted cancer studies on Roundup, even though they make the claim that Roundup does not cause cancer. But what really surprised me was that those court documents revealed that the EPA likely colluded with Monsanto to suppress human safety data regarding the association between glyphosate and cancer. For example, a senior EPA official actually killed the review of glyphosate that was supposed to take place by the US Department of, of Health and Human Services. So we'll, this is an ongoing um, court case, like I said, so hopefully in time we'll know the truth about glyphosate. Now, the second dramatic change in our food supply is what I call the homogenization of our diet. So when you go into the grocery store, um, you may buy a box of cereal, something like a raisin nut bran. You may have salad dressing for a salad that you might eat that day. Um, maybe a snack of a Nature Valley granola bar or Ritz crackers with cheese. And for dinner, you might have a a lean cuisine that ha contains meat and mushrooms and broccoli, and we can't forget the dessert, maybe a Chippewa cookie for dessert. Now, if you look at that, those dietary selections, it looks like a great variety in your diet, but the fact is, it's not. Variety is, has become an illusion. All of those foods contain synthetic processed corn byproducts. 
when, and it's not just those foods. When you walk into the grocery store, corn surrounds you on all sides. In fact, we now eat so much corn that a researcher at UC Berkeley was able to measure the amount of corn by using somebody's hair. You can actually measure a certain type of carbon that comes from corn. And what he found is that 69% of the carbon in our hair came from corn. That means that Americans are made up of more corn than Mexicans, whose staple diet actually consists of corn. So why do we have so much corn in our food supply? Well, it's largely due to the government subsidies, specifically the Farm Bill. For over 80 years, our tax dollars have funded a centralized food program that allows the government to pick winners and losers when it comes to crops. By using the Farm Bill, the government has been able to incentivize farmers to grow a handful of government-selected crops, and the most subsidized crop is corn. So what happens is farmers are paid to grow corn. So of course they're gonna grow corn and then we get too much corn is produced. Well, so the surplus is converted into cheap synthetic corn byproducts that are added to most of our food products. And since you literally become what you eat and Americans consume on average 75% of their calories from processed foods, we are literally becoming processed corn chips, to use a phrase that was originally coined by M Michael Pollan. But is that a bad thing? Is being a processed corn chip really a bad thing? Well, if you're grain sensitive, like I am, eating those foods can actually lead to leaky gut because corn is actually a grain, which means it contains gluten. But even if you're not grain sensitive, Corn contains relatively more omega-6 than omega-3 fatty acids, so it actually tends to be inflammatory. That means if you eat a lot of corn through your exposure in these processed foods, it can actually feed your cycle of inflammation, which may predispose you to developing an inflammatory disease. But beyond that, beyond the health concerns, it's, to me, this represents a loss of choice. It's a loss of freedom. What it means is that our food variety is dead. It's become an illusion. Like you might think that you're eating a prepackaged meal of broccoli and beef with a side of mashed potatoes, but you're really just eating different versions of corn by byproducts. Like when you stand in the cookie aisle, you may think you're choosing between chocolate chip cookies and peanut butter cookies, but you're really just choosing between synthetic processed corn byproducts and synthetic processed corn byproducts. <laughs> So by this distorting the market, the government has already largely chosen what's on your dinner plate, and they've actually chosen how much it will cost you. And that means that if you're a typical American who does consume 75% of their calories from these processed foods, then you've allowed the government to decide what chemicals you're made up of. In essence, you're consenting to allow the government to dictate your long-term health. And that may turn out to be a bad decision because in 2016, this, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, published a study in the Journal of American Medical Association that concluded that people who ate more of these subsidized foods were more likely to be obese, register higher levels of bad cholesterol, have higher blood sugar, and have higher levels of inflammation. Now, I am not suggesting that we boycott corn or we boycott corn byproducts. I'm simply suggesting that we become aware of what we're eating, as well as becoming aware of the unintended consequences that come with our food choices. All right. So the third dramatic change in our food is the food guide pyramid. <laughs> now, now, today it's called uh, my plate, but back when I was in school, it was called the food guide pyramid. Now, this is the government's way of telling all Americans over the age of two what they should eat and how much they should eat of it. So in essence, which foods are good and which foods are bad. It's a one-size-fits-all approach to our diet. Now, in my experience, one size never fits all. And I'm not, have you ever heard of the expression, one man's food is another man's poison? 
Well, at the base of the pyramid is grains. So if I ate according to the food guide pyramid, I would probably end up dead. <laughs> but what, what bothers me more about the food guide pyramid is the way that they nudge our behavior. So you may not think that you consciously, that you're thinking about the dietary guidelines or the food guide pyramid on a daily basis. But according to the government's own data, Americans are dutifully following these guidelines. You see, we were taught these guidelines at an early age in school, and they have become ingrained in our subconscious. They, in fact, are nudging our behavior. So for example, do you ever feel bad when you eat a cheeseburger instead of choosing chicken or fish? Or do you think that you should remove the skin from your chicken before you eat it? Or do you think that saturated fat can cause heart disease? Well, all of these beliefs stem from the food guide pyramid. But what if they're wrong? The government is so certain that these dietary guidelines are correct, that this food pyramid is taught as though it's fact, as though it's a certainty. In fact, they're so sure that it's accurate that the government touts it as a critical tool for medical doctors, dietitians, and nutritionists. So when you get sick, the diet advice is based off the pyramids. It, this pyramid is actually used to create all federal food and health policies and programs. That includes school lunches, the SNAP or the welfare program, and meals for the elderly. The pyramid's also used to determine what type of research the NIH will fund. And it's also used to create the educational materials that are disseminated across the United States to teach us how to eat, starting as young children. In fact, all of the advice and educational material is required by law to conform to the dietary guidelines. Now, needless to say, the guidelines are pervasive and influential in our society. But the truth is, the food guide pyramid was based on one man's hypothesis, one flawed, biased hypothesis that was never tested before it was unleashed onto Americans. And we now know that it's most likely making us sicker while eroding our freedom. The fourth dramatic change in our food supply is the introduction of synthetic chemicals. So when you walk into a grocery store, do you ever question if the food that's on the grocery store shelves is safe? Like, do you read the ingredient labels of your favorite box of cereal and wonder if those chemicals were tested for safety? You know, I contend that most of us don't because I never did. I assumed that somebody was testing the foods for safety. And why wouldn't I? We have an entire Food and Drug Administration, along with the USDA, that we pay with our tax dollars to protect our food. So why should we worry about it? Well, what if they're not doing their job? Or what if they're not doing the job that we think they're doing? That's actually a better question. There's been a dramatic shift from whole foods to processed foods over the past 60 years. And like I mentioned previously, currently 75% of the calories of the typical American diet come from processed foods. That's a huge shift. We used to eat predominantly whole foods and now we eat predominantly processed foods. And the majority of those foods contain synthetic chemicals that are made in a laboratory. So for instance, there's Mountain Dew. I used, I used to love Mountain Dew. I used to drink Mountain Dew with pizza. And <laughs> Why I would ever think that a solution that's almost glowing green is safe to drink, I don't know, but I did. I drank it and I loved it. But then one day I flipped over the bottle and I read the ingredient list and I saw brominated vegetable oil. Well, that's actually a patented flame retardant. It's banned in foods in Europe and Japan, but apparently it's good enough for us in America. <laughs> but we now know that brominated vegetable oil is an emulsifier, which studies are now showing can actually change your gut microflora. So you have microbes in your gut, like different types of 
um, pathogens like bacteria. And that's a good thing. You have microbes that help you. Um, but what happens is when you consume one of these emulsifiers, you can actually grow more of the bad or unfavorable bacteria, which can lead to leaky gut. And it's not just a Mountain Dew. This brominated vegetable oil is found in about 10% of sodas that are sold in, in the United States. And then another one of my favorites is Doritos. I used to love eating Doritos. I would actually line them up in between two pieces of bread in my sandwich. So I would have that crunch with the soft of the bread. It was, I loved it. But then one day I turned over the, box, the bag and I looked at the ingredients and I saw monosodium glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter The studies have shown can damage and even kill cells, including brain cells. Now again, we're not talking about acute or short-term short health effects. We are talking about long-term health effects. So this may be over decades. Another ingredient that caught my eye is disodium inosinate. This chemical is actually suspected of damaging organs and affecting fertility in the long term. Now, all of that might sound scary and possibly even alarmist because these chemicals have to be safe, right? Somebody must be testing them for safety because they're on our grocery store shelves. Well, this is where the story got interesting for me. As I dug into the, the um, as I dug into the research, I found that in 1958, Congress passed the Food Additive Amendment. And now the intention was great. The intention was to test chemicals for safety before they were added to our food, <laughs> which is a novel concept. <laughs> but now that amendment actually contains what is commonly referred to as the grass exemption. So if a product is grass, it's considered to be generally recognized as safe. That means that chemical does not have to go through an FDA approval process before it can arrive on your grocery store shelf. It gets a free pass directly from the lab to your dinner plate. Now the grass exemption was designed to be a good thing. It was meant to exempt commonly used ingredients like water and vinegar but it's turned into a loophole. The truth is there are roughly 10,000 chemical additives in our food supply. They are not tested by the FDA. They're not even regulated by the FDA. In fact, companies don't even have to notify the FDA when they release a new chemical on the market. The process is voluntary. And even organic foods can contain synthetic chemicals that have not been safety tested and are not regulated. Now we don't know what all of these chemicals are capable of doing because their long-term effects are typically not adequately studied. Sometimes they're not studied at all. Now when I learned about this grass loophole, I wondered why, why is the FDA not doing its job? So I reached out to the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, and I asked them that very question. And what the GAO told me is that Congress messed up. Congress never declared who would be responsible for grass determinations. So if you ask the FDA if they're doing their job, if you ask the FDA, is it your job to determine grass exemptions? The FDA will say no, because they believe the way the law was written, the responsibility falls on the company. So in that leadership vacuum, companies began declaring their own products as safe, legally. <laughs> legally, all companies, well, legally what companies need to do to declare a chemical to be grass is to get an expert to say that it's grass. So who are these experts? Well, in 2013, a study was published in the Journal of American Medical Association that revealed that these experts are commonly bought and paid for by industry. They're typically employees of the company or they're hired consultants or they hold stock. In essence, they have close ties to industry. And as soon as an expert declares the chemical to be safe, that chemical can be immediately added to our food. 
there is no waiting period and there's no requirement to even notify the FDA. So unfortunately, grass has become a loophole that may in fact be adulterating our food supply. And now the FDA has taken a back seat while the American people have become the long-term safety study for these grass chemicals. Now, Doritos also contain uh, genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And that is the fifth dramatic change that has occurred in our food supply within the past 60 years. So when GMOs were introduced into our food supply, they fundamentally transformed our food. And I'll give you one example. The corn that we ate as children is no longer the type of corn that we eat today. Today, scientists literally add bacterial genes to our corn. And those genes force the corn to produce a toxin in nearly every cell of that corn. It's called Bt toxin. In essence, it's a pesticide. So when a bug bites into the corn, it kills the bug by breaking open its stomach. And that actually sounds pretty ingenious. But the problem is that we eat that corn too. That means with every bite of corn, you literally ingest a toxin. Now the chemical companies that make the genetically modified corn, and let me say that again, the chemical companies that make the corn, chemical companies are now making most of the food that we eat. Well, those companies said that the toxins would not affect humans, that it would only affect the bugs. But now we're learning through studies that the toxin that's produced in that corn may also break open our guts. It may contribute to leaky gut over time as well. And as I previously mentioned, corn is abundant in our processed foods. And that corn is primarily genetically modified corn. It's estimated that 75% of all the processed foods in your grocery store contain genetically modified ingredients, including genetically modified corn. So how did GMOs get approved by our government? Well, GMOs are presumed by the FDA to be grass. So they fell into the grass loophole, which means there's practically no safety testing, toxicity testing, long-term testing, regulation, or monitoring required by the FDA. Now to me, that's kind of scary because without adequate long-term safety testing, you and I are the guinea pigs in a nationwide experiment. We have become the long-term safety study. And only time will tell us if GMOs are bad for us. So that, those are the five dramatic changes that have occurred in our food supply within the past 60 years. And it might sound kind of overwhelming. So what do we do about it? Well, I believe that we have to change the system. And I thought that was going to be very difficult to do before I started researching it further. And it's actually easier than I thought. Um, I believe that there are two main components involved with changing the system. The first one is to heal yourself, and the second component is to harness your power. So how do you heal yourself? Now this slide I'll go over relatively quickly. Um, I'm happy to answer questions during the Q&A or if you wanna contact me directly with a more personal question, um, I'm completely at your access. So this is one of the most common questions that I'm asked is how did I heal myself? How was I able to reverse my autoimmune disease? Now admittedly, this is a controversial topic. If you ask most Western medicine doctors They'll tell you that reversing a chronic or an inflammatory disease is not possible. They might prescribe a medication to try to stop the progression of the disease or at least try to slow it down. But in their view, there's little that can be done to help somebody with one of these inflammatory or chronic diseases. But I'm living proof that it is possible to reverse an inflammatory disease. I mean, like I said, I could barely even grab a cup or, or walk to the mailbox. And now I'm out hiking with my dog and I'm lifting my three-year-old and just the other day I was ripping bushes out of the backyard. 
But I'm not the only proof we have. Peer-reviewed scientific studies have been published in reputable journals showing that all kinds of inflammatory diseases, from diabetes to Alzheimer's to kidney disease to ADHD, they all have been reversed. So we know it's possible. So how do you do it? So it's, it's critical to remember that all chronic diseases are actually inflammatory diseases. They all have that inflammatory component underlying their mechanism. And we, all, we know that all inflammatory diseases have a root cause. They all have the triggers that I talk about. And that's great news because if you can find the root cause, you can reverse the disease or at least minimize it and improve your quality of life. So how did I reverse mine? I followed this framework. It's what I call the four R's. Now this is a highly individualized process. So I'm just gonna um, touch on a few examples of what I did to reverse my disease. The first R is to remove. You must remove the triggers and the toxins. So again, some of my triggers were food triggers like grain. I even got to the point where bay leaf was a trigger for me. Um, also, dairy and eggs were a big trigger for me. Um, now, when you identify your triggers, the good news is when you remove them, your symptoms can dissipate quickly. So within three days of removing my final triggers, which were dairy and eggs, within three days, I actually had all of my pain in my body go away. It completely went away in three days. So this process can happen quickly. Um, so other triggers, they may be chemicals in your environment. Stress is a huge trigger. Um, and then removing toxins. Like I said, I had arsenic poisoning. It's estimated that most of us have some type of heavy, metal, uh, heavy metals in our body, um, which can actually cause an inflammatory process as well. The second R is to replenish. Um, this is to replenish nutrients that, you're lo that you lost. Um, studies are showing now that almost all Americans, it's estimated, are deficient in at least one nutrient. Leaky gut actually impairs your ability to digest and absorb nutrients. So that's how I ended up being deficient in 15 nutrients, even though I was taking a multivitamin and mineral every day. So the second thing to replenish is your energy. Um, it's sleep is critical for repair, and you need to repair in order to heal from a disease. So some cancer survivors that I've, I've listened to their testimony, and they will say that they actually budget in time for sleep. Uh, the third R is to repair. You have to repair the gut lining. In order to do that, you have to remove the triggers first, and you have to replenish the nutrients that you've lost. And then also along repair is to repair the damaged tissue. Now this is the amazing part, your body regenerates itself. It's estimated that roughly every seven years, you get almost a whole new body. So you have the ability to decide what chemicals you want your body to be made up of. And I think that's an amazing opportunity for us. Um, the third R is to reconnect. That's to reconnect with yourself, with community, with food, and with family. Um, the first one to reconnect with yourself, my doctor told me that the only way I was gonna be able to heal from my disease was if I changed my lifestyle. So I had to actually ask myself certain questions to find my purpose, like what am I living for? Who am I living for? What are my core principles? What does happy look like? And why am I not doing more things to make me happy? <laughs> um, so reconnecting with yourself is critical. Reconnecting with community, we know now that laughter really is one of the best medicines. Studies are showing that connecting with people and having feeling that support and laughing together, it can improve your health by not only decreasing stress hormones, it improves your gut microflora, so it allows more of the good bacteria to flourish, and laughing can actually turn on anti-inflammatory genes. So by laughing, you're actually healing yourself. Um, and then reconnecting with food, um, reading your food labels, finding out what it is that's in the food that you're eating. We actually play this game with our kids where we try to read the food label out loud to see how many words we can pronounce. 
um, you can ask the butcher where the beef was raised and what the, what the cow was fed. Um, just getting you to reconnect or become closer to your food is helpful. Um, we also practice in our family now what we call mindful eating. And this is being aware, so not eating on the go. We actually sit down now as a family for every meal and we eat. One thing that I was surprised to learn is that it's estimated that 60% and maybe up to 80% of your digestion does not happen in your gut. It actually happens in your brain. So just like you would like get your kids prepared to go to bed by reading them a bedtime story and tucking them in, we get prepared for eating a meal. And we do that by praying before each meal and, and utilizing the power of positive thinking. Because if you switch your mind to that mindset of positive thinking, like expressing gratitude, for instance, it actually primes you to receive the food better. It changes the microbes in your gut. Um, and um, it can actually improve the amount of nutrients that you can digest and absorb from your food. And then the last part of reconnecting is connecting with your family. So I knew that my success in this journey was going to be dependent on support from my family. Now changing my eating habits was going to be difficult enough that I didn't want to have to fight my whole family. So I tried to bring them along with me in this journey. Um, so for instance, we, we, we created a curriculum for our children that was based on health and nutrition. Um, and we got them in the kitchen. I actually taught my children math by getting them in the kitchen. We planted gardens together. We taught them how to read food labels. Um, and actually when we found out last year that we could not eat grain and that I had passed that gene to my children, um, my son decided that he wanted to help other children by providing healthy alternatives to some of our favorite treats. So together we created um, a cookbook that's completely grain free and it doesn't have any additives or preservatives or GMOs in it. And this is one of the gifts that each of you will receive tonight as a thank you for attending um, this, um, this discussion. Um, one thing I wanted to point out that's in this cookbook are product comparisons. And this is how I got my children to opt in to eating um, these healthier food choices for us. So we decided that we didn't want to force our children to eat a certain way, that we wanted them to be able to make the decision for themselves so that it would become more of a long-term, um, like so that they wouldn't possibly rebel against the decision. I think we we're forcing them to do something. So what we did was once my son created his own version, grain-free version of one of his favorite treats. We would read the food label and we would do this product comparison together. So for instance, in his version of a brownie, there's no dyes. Well, he compared his to Little, Little Debbie Fudge Brownie and he saw that theirs contains red dye 40, which studies have, been, have associated red dye 40 with hyperactivity in children, tumor growth and DNA damage in mice. Um, his brownies have no preservatives. Well, the counterpart has TBHQ, which is made from coal tar and petroleum. It's used in varnish and lacquers, and it's associated with DNA damage in animal studies. And the list goes on. But this way, he can see the components of each, and he can decide for himself which one he wants to eat. Fortunately, he decided that his was a better version for his body. <laughs> um, now, if you are interested in learning more about how to reverse an autoimmune disease or an inflammatory disease, I wrote um, a blog post on this on my website, which also has some tests that my doctor recommends. Um, so this is another resource for you if you wanna utilize that. Okay, the, the second step in changing the system is harnessing your power. Now this is where my CSG training comes into play. Hands Off My Food is actually a book that focuses on solutions. I do walk you through the truth behind what's in our food supply and how it got there, but the focus is on fixing the problem. And the solutions that I provide in the book are largely based on the principles that were taught in the Center for Self-Governance. So this, this last portion of the talk is likely gonna sound familiar to everybody. So our republic was built on the premise that all power lies within the people. 
According to the Declaration of Independence, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The key word here is consent. Because what that means is that each of us has the power to restore the integrity of the food that we eat and reclaim the freedoms that we've lost by taking back our consent. Our consent is what gives government and the food industry authority and influence over our food supply. Therefore, to change our food supply, you simply need to selectively give your consent. And that's how you can effectively assert your power. But how? How do you selectively give your consent? Well, you may not be aware of it, but you're already giving your consent. Each time you spend money at a grocery store, a fast food restaurant, a vending machine, a hot dog stand, you speak with your dollars. For instance, when I drank Mountain Dew, I was telling the maker of Mountain Dew and the FDA that I was okay with drinking plain retardants. And when I purchased Doritos, I was consenting to allow industry to change the unique genetic makeup of our plants and animals. Every day, the food industry and the government hear your message loud and clear. They hear you through your dollars. In essence, you are voting for your food supply with your dollars. Now, I think that's an amazing opportunity that we have because what that means is that our food supply is a reflection of how we spend our dollars. Consequently, it changes with the choices that we make on a daily basis. And that's fabulous news because that means we can begin to change our food supply right now. With each purchase, we have the ability to shape our food supply into what we want it to be. And that means we create our food supply. And once we accept that responsibility, we become empowered. We can begin to understand that since we created it, we can fix it. We don't need the government or the industry to fix the problem. The power lies within the people. So what will you do with your power? What will you stand for? I encourage each of you to discover your core principles. And once you know your core principles, you can apply them to your food choices. For example, I used to stand for the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> I bought his chocolate cake mix regularly. In fact, back in college, I could eat an entire box of Pillsbury cake mix on a Friday night all by myself. <laughs> But then I thought, what does the Pillsbury Doughboy stand for? When I look at the ingredient label, I see he stands for propylene glycol. Well, that's used to make antifreeze and paint, and studies show it may be toxic to the central nervous system over time. He also stands for xanthan gum, which is an emulsifier that we now know can change your gut microflora. He also stands for natural and artificial flavor. Now this has become a catch-all group. One flavor can be made up of a hundred different chemicals. And that list of chemicals is often proprietary. So they don't have to tell you what the chemicals are in that flavoring. And the Pillsbury Doughboy also stands for BHT, which is used in embalming fluid and jet fuel. And studies have shown that in, in animals, it promotes tumor growth and can damage your DNA. And now it's not labeled, but the cake mix also contains genetically modified ingredients. Once I realized what I was eating, I knew I had a choice to make. So I decided that I didn't want to stand for untested and unregulated chemicals in my food. I didn't want to consent to that. So I decided to send a message to the government and the food industry that I will no longer eat untested and unregulated chemicals. How did I do that? I stopped purchasing the Pillsbury cake mix. Now that doesn't mean you have to go without your cake mix. What that means is you can choose to buy from a different company, one that's in line with your principles one that doesn't utilize untested and unregulated chemicals in their cake mix. Maybe it's a, a, chem, uh, a company 
that sells cake mixes that only contains ingredients that you would find in your kitchen. And those companies do exist in the grocery stores. Likewise, if allowing industry to play the role of God by changing the unique genetic makeup of our plants and animals is not aligned with your core principles, you can choose to buy processed foods that contain the butterfly. I love the butterfly because it's the seal of the non-GMO project, which is an independent organization that is dedicated to preserving and building a food supply that is not genetically engineered. So when I purchase products that contain the butterfly, I'm utilizing a free market solution to getting rid of genetically engineered foods. And actually, we used to make it a game with our children that they would run through the grocery store and find processed foods that have the butterfly. And those are the foods that they knew that we could buy, that they could eat. <laughs> now, standing, by, standing for your principles doesn't mean that you have to eat twigs and leaves, as my husband would say. <laughs> now, he used to love eating Pop-Tarts until he read my chapter on GMO. <laughs> Then he decided that he didn't want to support uh, genetically modified ingredients anymore. So it doesn't mean he, he gave up that type of food. What it means is he found a different alternative. He found this brand, Nature's Path Organic, that does carry the butterfly. The same thing happened with his cereal. He gave up his GMO-filled cereal, and he found a similar cereal that does carry the butterfly. So he was able to actually stand by his principle and not have to give up his favorite foods. Now, I feel that this is an amazing opportunity that, opportunity that we have sitting right in front of us. Because each and every day, we have the ability to protect our long-term health and reclaim the freedoms that we've lost by making simple and easy solutions, or sorry, simple and easy choices in the marketplace. And it all starts by asking yourself, what am I consenting to? Now, if you'd like to seize that opportunity, I put together an electronic companion guide to help get you started, which each of you are gonna to receive tonight. Um, this guide contains ideas on how to move the market. Now, these are just ideas. It's designed for you to be able to pick and choose the ideas that resonate with you and the ideas that are aligned with your core principles. It's based on the concept of feed the good and starve the bad. So for instance, I provide tips when you're at the grocery store. And one of those tips could be say no to farmed fish, say yes to wild caught fish. How do you do that? Read the food label, make sure it says wild caught. And now why would you do that? To starve companies that feed antibiotics and GMOs to fish, and to feed companies that, pr that protect your long-term health. In addition, if you would like to take action, I do have a take action page on my website. Um, these are simple and quick um, actions that you can take. So for instance, one of my current projects is we're trying to move the market by encouraging Nestle to label their products that contain GMOs. So you can click on the link on my website and sign the petition and you're done. You've, you've stood for a principle and you've helped us move the market. Um, in addition, I have a free newsletter that I provide that you can sign up for on my website. That newsletter provides you with recipes that help move the market. Also, updates on our food supply that are always accompanied with solutions. So I belong to a lot of different um, blogs and newsletters where I'm constantly bombarded with negative um, comments about our food supply and it just it seems overwhelming and daunting for me. So what I decided to do was to try to keep people informed but also empower them by providing solutions and if it resonates with you then I encourage you to utilize those solutions. I think another thing that I'm starting this month with my newsletters is I am providing um, coupons. So, and the reason is because the comment that I'm getting from people is that they want to eat healthier, but it's just so expensive. And I agree, it is more expensive. So what I'm doing in an attempt to not only feed the good companies, but also to try to make the, the healthier food options more affordable, 
is I am calling companies whose principles are in line with mine, and I'm asking if they will provide discounts or coupons to um, the people who are my subscribers. Um, and the first coupon is gonna come out this next week. In addition, I also am about to launch a forum um, because people are telling me that they want to have support and they wanna be able to share ideas and also share deals that they find so we can all benefit um, from, e from each other's knowledge and experience. So I am in the process of building this forum. And if you like more information, about the corruption that exists in our food and what we can do about it. And actually, a chapter that this audience may particularly enjoy is in section one when I talk about the birth of the FDA and how it was built on a lie and we discuss whether or not the FDA is even constitutional. Um, so that's all in my book. But what I would like to leave you with today is a question of what message will you send today? Because food is information. With every bite of food, you literally determine your long-term health. You change your gut microbes. You change your hormone level. You change your level of inflammation. You change your gene expression with the foods that you eat. Your health is in your hands because you decide which food you eat. But also, you determine what our food supply looks like you vote with every bite of food. You're voting for what you want our food supply to be. So I ask you, what message will you send today? What message will you send your body? And what message will you send to the food industry and the government? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. So fantastic. Well, thank you. Such a great presentation. Thank you so much for that. Now, everyone, the chat feature had been open this evening and no one did uh, any questions to log at uh, any certain time. So if you'd like to go ahead and ask a question, please do. Um, the one question I had, I'll I'll, I'll get it going. I personally think this book would be an amazing gift for some people. Is there any way for us to get you <laughs> to write a personal message or um, just even an autographed copy of your book instead of going through Amazon? Is there a way to get that done? Yes, actually. Um, and I could actually do that for cheaper than what you could get it on Amazon. So um, on Amazon, the book is $14.99. Um, I'm able to order, um, I could do a bulk order. And the books are $10 when I order them in bulk. And it's only $3 to ship it media. So it would be $13 for like a signed copy of it. Oh, great. So is the best way to handle that for our guests this evening, just directly contact you? Yeah, they can either, they could call or email me. Um, my email, it, well, did you give them my email or no? Okay, so my email, it's my first name. It's S-I-N-A at 1791.com. And then if you, and then if you have other questions too, if you can feel free to email me them, you can also email me through my website, which is handsoffmyfood.com, um, or you can phone me. Um, so my cell phone number is 239-410-0409. Um, can you say that one more time? Sure, it's 239-410-0409. 0479. Perfect. I've got that typed into the chat feature, everybody. Oh, great. Uh, Pam has a question. It says, let's see, I just scrolled up on that, Pam. Sorry, give me one more second. What do you suggest in handling students?
agricultural groups like Future Farmers of America, FFA. My kids are both heavily involved and the organization pushes conventional Roundup Ready GMO thinking on the kids and teachers, et cetera. Um, okay, can, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, half of the question, it, it's like I only heard half of the words. Could you please, sorry, just repeat it one more time? Sure. What do you suggest in handling student agricultural groups like the Future Farmers of America? Pam says that her kids are both heavily involved and the organization pushes the conventional Roundup Ready GMO thinking on the kids and teachers. Oh, wow. Um, do you know who funds the FFA? I don't know. Let me unmute. Okay. Here. Oh, is that, was that the answer to the question? It's that it's corporate ag that funds it? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> I love that question and I have not gotten that question yet. That's an excellent one. Um, so the reason I hesitate is because in the book, I talk about the intimidation and the retribution that occurs when you come out against some of these companies like Monsanto. Um, it can be so severe that I actually contemplated whether or not I should publish this book. My editor actually told me I needed to get a lawyer. Um, so, and I could go into more stories like that um, in experts that I interviewed for the book and warnings that they gave me. So what, the reason I share that with you is because what would be ideal is, is if the children can be made aware of what's going on because I think all change begins with awareness and which is the education component. So it would require someone to teach them something different in that same setting to present a different option. Now to do that, you're going up against those big ad companies. <laughs> right. So um, they would have to be somebody who doesn't have a lot to lose, let's say. Like, I wouldn't mind going myself and talking to FFA groups because um, I'm, homes I'm, I'm a homeschool mom. So they can intimidate me and they can harass me and they can get me audited, uh, things like that. And they can sue me and get me to pull my book off the market, but I'm not going to get fired, you know? Right. Um, but that's, in my opinion, after doing all this research, that's what you're up against. So unfortunately, I don't have... A positive you know quick solution for you on that one um, I think that in my opinion as a parent um, I am all for um, protecting our parental rights with at, at every possible turn and I believe that if the parents of the children in those groups educated themselves and started teaching the children themselves, then that would start some momentum there. You know, because um, I think in the situation like that, it's, it's probably going to have to start in the home. Um, unless you were able to contact somebody who they got permission to go to one of those FFA groups and speak. I mean, that's another that could be another hurdle is even just getting permission by the groups to allow one of those people to come speak. So if you want, I can look more into that to figure out, you know, what other people's experiences have been and if I can offer you another solution. But my initial thought based on my experience and my research is that that change is going to have to start with the parents. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Jessica has the next question, and it says, do you know if a need for proton pump inhibitors like Nexium, Prilesic, sorry, et cetera, is related to chronic inf inflammation? I'm concerned about this in myself, 
and my family and don't know where to start looking for healing and alternatives? Um, yes. Yes, those can be related to inflammation. And in fact, when I was seeing, when I was in my, on my search for answers and I was seeing multiple Western medicine doctors, multiple GI specialists, they determined that I had um, too much acid produced in my stomach and they wanted to put me on one of those proton pump inhibitors and it didn't feel right to me. I, I, so I said, no, well, come to find out uh, last year, my functional medicine doctor was able to determine that I actually don't produce enough acid, which is a, it's, this is a common situation that's happening now where you have the Western medicine side saying you produce too much acid and trying to give you these, um, chemicals to inhibit the production. And then on the flip side, you have the functional medicine doctor saying, no, it's just the opposite. They're not producing enough acid. So in my case, it's true. I wasn't producing enough acid. Um, and that's because I had leaky gut for so long. What happens is when you have it for an extended period of time, you can actually develop scarring along your GI tract um, in the stomach. I had scarring in my stomach that scarred over what are called parietal cells. And those are the cells that release the acid in your stomach. And so it inhibited my stomach from releasing sufficient acid. And this is why I started to reject, for instance, the bone broths. You need a lot of acid to be able to, to digest protein. And I haven't been able to digest protein for years because of this low of stomach acid. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. The proton pump inhibitors we now know can cause um, inflammation. They may contribute to leaky gut as well. And oftentimes we're misdiagnosed as having too much acid. Um, and you might have some symptoms, like I was feeling like I had acid reflux, even though I had too little acid. Um, so it is, uh, it is hotly debated right now because the Western medicine and the functional medicine doctors have differing opinions on it. Hello? <laughs> Did we lose Michelle? Michelle, are you there? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I opened up the mic for Jessica and shut myself down. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, I opened your mic. Uh, did, you, did that answer your question sufficiently or did you want to add anything else? Well, let's go on to Dale's question. Let's see. Is the Roundup that is sprayed on sugar beets absorbed into the sugar beet and therefore into us when we eat the product? Um, yes, now it, it depends on which produce you're talking about, but yes, in general, it is believed that these chemicals um, are absorbed into the produce, and um, this is why you can't wash them off. So, for instance, the Environmental Working Group comes out with their list of dirty dozen every year, and that's a list of the, the top 12 dirtiest produce which means they have the most pesticide and pesticide residues. And what they test also is if you wash it, do you still have the pesticide residues on there? And the answer is typically yes. It does get absorbed into the produce. So um, this is why, like now my family is completely organic now. Um, and we have, my husband's really good at trying to figure out ways to reduce the cost. So we, we're able to afford it because we do a lot of budgeting um, and we buy a lot in bulk, for instance. But the answer to that question is yes. And so when we started out, since it was so expensive, what I did was I used that dirty dozen list. So any fruit and vegetable that was on the dirty dozen list, I made sure I bought those fruits and vegetables organic. 
And then some of the others I would buy as conventional because we weren't, we weren't able to make the switch financially, like all of a sudden. So we did it slowly and that's how we did it. I do know that, uh, I, I don't know if anybody has this store in their location, but here in Tennessee, we have a chain called Aldi, A-L-D-I, and it's an off-priced grocery store chain, but they have come out um, as a huge distributor for well-priced organics. So there is huge competition happening in the marketplace that people can take advantage of if they would find out the resources at hand. Most folks would not think of a grocery store where you have to bag your own groceries and it's considered all off-brand food uh, to be one of the best suppliers of organics. So it's interesting. There yes. is definitely change in the market. Rainbow or that's, that's what we have in our area. That's like what she's talking about. All the, they do, yeah. So it'd be worth going to just check. Yes, and yes, and that's a very good point. Um, yes, the trend is actually our friend right now. Organics is the largest uh, growing sector in the food industry, which is great. It means that people are moving the market. And um, the what's happening because of that is that grocery stores that don't norm, wouldn't normally carry organics, they're starting to carry them. So you see like Walmart carrying some organics and food lion and Wegman yeah. has grass fed beef now. So, so this concept of the power line within the people, the people being able to move the market to solve this food problem, it is catching on. Um, and you can see it for yourself in the marketplace. So the thought is that as we keep moving the market, that price gap between conventional and organic, it's going to continue to decrease. That would be wonderful for everybody's pocketbooks. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have one more question. It looks like from Kevin. And Kevin wants to know, what do you think of probiotics? Uh, probiotics can be very useful. My family is on probiotics right now. Um, you got to be careful that you get like the right types of strains for your body um, and that you get strains that that are good quality. Um, I used to work in the supplement field, so I worked a lot with probiotics. Um, and there's a lot of products out there that are just not good. Um, so if you get a good product, then probiotics can be very beneficial. Uh, my son and I actually, he's seven now. Last year, he was also diagnosed with leaky gut and had um, a really bad microbiome uh, profile. So he had a lot of overgrowth of bad bacteria and he was low in a lot of good microbes in his gut. And we've now been able to reverse that through some diet changes and through probiotic supplementation. So it definitely uh, has its place. Um, I'm of the camp that you don't want to just supplement with one kind all the time. Uh, in our case, what worked well for us was we had a fecal test done to actually determine the variety of microbes that we had so we can target what we needed in our supplements. Um, and then we, once we have completely healed, we will change up our probiotics. So we won't always take the same one because you want a variety of probiotics in, you, in your diet. And we already know that we're losing great a variety and diversity in our gut microbes because of our food supply. So, for instance, um, the, proce the processed foods are typically called, referred to as dead foods uh, because they're not living anymore. They don't have these microbiomes, mi microbes on them. And so we are losing diversity in our guts. And so this is one reason why I believe the people are now finding out that they need to supplement with probiotics is to replenish and get more of those microbes in their, in their system. Um, I do also like natural sources of probiotics. So like sauerkraut, or if you could have like a kefir, um, you know, fermented uh, vegetables are a great source of probiotics. I eat sauerkraut on my salads almost every single day. Um, so anytime you can get a natural source, um, I personally tend to go towards a natural source because they also have 
other properties in them that are beneficial for your body as well. Um, but yeah, did that answer that question? <laughs> I believe so. And Kevin okay. also uh, weighed in again. He said, I heard that Costco had purchased land and plans to pay farmers to farm organics for their stores. So again, you know, weighing in that certain manufacturers and store owners at large levels, Costco's big time, are adding, um, adding um, certainly the organics to their lines. Um, Dale asks, could a diagnosis of Crohn's disease be a misdiagnosis and be leaky gut instead or, is, or, or a result of the things that you have been sharing with us tonight? Um, so leaky gut can lead to Crohn's disease. So I'm not sure about misdiagnosis because I'm not sure how you were tested for it um, and, and all the variables involved with it. but Yes, without a doubt, leaky gut can lead to Crohn's disease, which is fabulous news because Crohn's disease is also an inflammatory disease and it can mm -hmm. be reversed. So the goal there would be to figure out what your triggers are. Now, to do that, um, that could be very, very frustrating because, for instance, we found out one of my triggers is bay leaf. I would have never guessed that bay leaf was triggering a leaky gut situation for me. So um, I was able to figure out most of my triggers on my own by doing diet elimination and reintroduction, but it's, it's a lot of guesswork when you're doing that and it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. So if I could do it over again, and if, if I had the knowledge that I have now, I would have simply had the blood test done. Uh, that's how we figured out my final triggers. My doctor ordered a blood test for food and environmental sensitivities, as well as a blood test for food allergies. Now that's the one that would normally be done in a doctor's office, uh, the food allergy test. I am not allergic to any foods, which was kind of shocking. All of my uh, issues with foods are because I have food sensitivities, and that's because of the leaky gut. So um, there's a test that you can either have, you can, you can get it through your doctor or you can actually order it on your own if your doctor won't order it for you. There's a lab that does that test. Uh, so if, and if anyone's interested in that test, I can, send, I can send the links to it in an email. Did you mention that um, your doctor was an internist, did you say? My doctor? No. So my doctor is a functional medicine doctor. Functional medicine. Okay. Yeah. And now knowing what I know now, I only go to functional medicine doctors. Okay. So the, in case people, in cases, you know, if this is the first time you're hearing about a functional medicine doctor, I'll just say briefly, their goal is to determine the root cause of an illness. So they look at your body as a whole. Um, and how, and they believe that every single organ system and every cell is all interconnected. So they look to see the underlying cause for all your symptoms. Whereas um, in the medical, in the Western medicine approach, they are excellent at um, trauma care. I mean, we, our medical system is unparalleled, it's unmatched when it comes to emergency and trauma. Um, but when it comes to preventative and like dealing with chronic illnesses, they are highly trained um, and they're really good at it in uh, prescribing medications. And um, it's not, this was something that took me a while to actually come to terms with. This was in part of my recovery because I was angry for a long time. Like I was angry at the medical establishment. I was angry at the medical doctors because they couldn't fix me. Like nobody knew what was wrong. And then I was angry that they were telling me that it was in my head. So um, I had a lot of issues to get over. But what I realized is that I had a misplaced expectation on the medical system. I viewed these, these medical doctors like on a pedestal, like almost like a God that they could heal people. Um, 
And so I assumed that they would be able to connect my disease, the origin of my disease with diet. And that was a misplaced expectation on my part because the truth is roughly two thirds of all the medical schools in America don't require doctors to even take one nutrition class. Hmm. So it's not their fault, right? The medical doctors are just simply not trained in nutrition. So, but I went in there to their office expecting them to do something that they're not trained to do. Now, in contrast, the, and this is, this is a completely different topic, also controversial, but um, since you asked, I'll throw it in there. The medical establishment, um, they're the, in essence, the medical schools and their curriculum is largely influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. And they sit on the medical boards, which means that they help determine what the medical students are taught. And this started way back in the early 1900s with Rockefeller and Carnegie. Um, so it's just, it's continued, it's a continued trend. So it's, it's, you, it's not um, kind of out of left field to then expect that the doctors are going to be trained in, in pharmaceuticals. And so when you go into their office, that's what they're trained to do. And that's what they're going to prescribe to you as the pharmaceuticals. All right. And that was my experience too, with the medical field. Uh, in contrast, these functional medicine doctors are trying to figure out the root cause. They don't want to medicate the symptom. Like they don't want to treat the symptom. They want to figure out what's causing the symptom and then treat it at that root cause. Um, to to eliminate the problem. Thank you. Uh, we're we have exceeded ninety minutes, and out of respect for everybody's time this evening, we're gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and read the last two postings, and of course, perfectly said, Marion. Excellent work, Cena. You wedded two important aspects your passion for food and for the Republic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he has a great idea. I would like to offer this. I often call companies to ask for clarification on ingredients. And when they refuse to tell me what the natural ingredients are, I say, well, then I will not buy your product again. I want to know what is in my food. Without full disclosure, I cannot support you. That is another way to vote. Yes, I love that. I love that. Yeah, in, in my book, in the grass chapter, that's one of the solutions that I propose. So that, that's awesome. You're perfectly aligned with what I'm saying. I love it. Yeah, it's a great suggestion as well. And then Kevin said, you talked about reaching a tipping point with bad food over time. What you, have you ever heard of someone going to into anaphylactic shock from food when eating foods that had always been tolerable? Dr. Mark Hyman is a functional medicine doctor at the Cleveland Clinic, and he has a lot of information online, evidently, that we can all check into. Thank you for that, Kevin. But had you heard of anybody ever going into anaphylactic shock from food? Um, yes, and I'll, I'll add, yes, I love Dr. Hyman. He also has some good books out there. Um, and if you wanted more information, uh, if you can get it from my doctor too, um, Dr. Peter Osborne. Um, and I, I believe they're actually friends. Um, my doctor has a book called No Grain, No Pain. Um, and it goes in detail about foods and um, how they can react with your body in different ways. But yes, I have heard of, of that happening with someone going into anaphylactic shock when they could tolerate a food before and then they couldn't um, afterwards. Um, and that could very well be from a leaky gut situation. Um, and it is, you're absolutely right. It is about a tipping point. It's, we're all individuals. We all have our own individual tipping point. Um, and there is a point if you don't remove the trigger, so like that food for instance, uh, then there is a point where you can develop a, a full-blown allergy from that food. And it's all through that inflammatory process that we talked about. So interesting. And I'm afraid if we sat here for three hours, we could keep the discussion going. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm sure you know, are fully aware, having written this book, that 
it impacts everybody. Um, just amazing information and your future is just bound to be wonderful based on all your research and how well you present the information. Um, I encourage everyone to share her book with your network of friends, encourage them to purchase this important work. And she's been so gracious as to offer us a uh, two-way conversation this evening to get some of these questions answered and also to hear this wonderful presentation. And she'll keep the conversation going with you offline, which is very generous of you. Thank you so much for offering that to us. We sure. value that very much. Um, could, could I add one oh, comment? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's something that just popped in my head. It's related to the, the um, FFA question. So one, one way that maybe you wouldn't have to go through all like jumping through the hoops and, you know, potentially experiencing backlash from the big ag. Um, one idea is that if it's your child in FFA, you could um, take them to another organization for them to hear an, another opinion. So for instance, I live in Virginia and we have a group called the Virginia Independent Consumers and Farmers Association. And I don't know if you've heard of Joel Salatin from Polyface Farm. He's in a lot of the, he was in um, Michael Pollan's Omnivore Dilemma book and, um, you know, other, other food documentaries. I, I buy all my meat from Polyface Farm. I love him. Anyways, he's one of the members of this um, uh, Virginia Independent Consumers and Farmers Association. And they welcome anybody to come to their meeting and to listen and to ask the farmers questions directly. Uh, so that is another option just to kind of balance it out. You know, if they're getting all of this big ag info and pro GMO and pro pesticides from their FFA class, you could take them over to another organization that is more about sustainable farming and, you know, uh, like Dalatin's very much into um, like the humane treatment of animals and having them raised as naturally, as close to their natural habitat as possible. So you could bring them to one of those organizations and, and have them maybe see those farms, see how they run, how they operate, talk to those farmers themselves and hear their concerns and kind of their perspective on it too. Yeah, Pam knows who Joel is because she wrote in the chat, love Joel. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I love him too. And actually, yeah, he's a fellow libertarian. So I, we have great conversations. <laughs> That's wonderful. I look forward to trying your son's recipes. I'm going to try those out at my house as soon as we can. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Everybody, I wanted to let you know that the link she talked about and your free gifts for tonight, we're going to be sending out a wrap-up email, and all that information will be in that email. So, so don't worry about that. And I'm also going to include how you can support CSG every time you purchase through amazon.com. And it's extremely easy. You just have to go to smile.amazon.com and it allows you to choose from several charities to support with every purchase you make through Amazon. And um, CSG is listed. So if you um, think to do that, that we would really appreciate that. We get a small check every month from Amazon and everything helps. Um, to take advantage of this event, all prior CSG speaker series from 2016 and 17, and then all future events, we look to enroll people in our mutually pledged monthly partner program. And that helps CSG with our budgeting, as you can imagine. Uh, it's challenging as a nonprofit, and the more people we have coming on board and uh, pledging a minimum of $10 a month, the more we are to, able to um, plan long-term what we can afford as an organization. But one of our thank you gifts to our donors in this program is free access to these speaker series. We'll probably have six more uh, for the end of this year, so it's a great value as you can see from the quality of our program this evening. And again, thank you to Dr. Sina McCullough. She was, you're just a delight. Thank you so much. <laughs> Something that was rather complex and intimidating, just so palatable, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs>
just really, really enjoyed it. And I will continue to use your book every day in my own home. And I invite oh. everyone else to do the same. Well, thank you so much. And um, I just, I want to actually ex extend a special thank you to you guys and to everybody who attended tonight. Um, because as you can imagine, this book is very controversial. And I'm actually having a hard time getting it out there in the public domain because I don't promote, the left doesn't like the book in so far because I don't promote the government as a solution. And the right is not necessarily liking my book, um, you know, for various reasons. And they think that just because I'm questioning the safety by bringing up the corruption, that it's anti-business, which is, could not be further from the truth. Um, so it is a libertarian perspective of the food supply. And I'm, it's kind of like sitting there in the middle and um, it, it's having it's it's having a hard time getting its way out there. But you know, I feel like it, it's meant to be, and it's it's a good time um, in our society to be aware of these these issues and to be and to really be aware that we can change it. So we're just going to keep praying that it gets out there. <laughs> well, Mother's Day and Father's Day is coming up. It's a great <laughs> buy it as a gift with a I don't know, throw in some sauerkraut. You recommend? <laughs> Like a little gift basket. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And I wish you a very good week. Please stay in touch with CSG. Let us know if we can host classes in your area. Let us know if you need help with any of your team program requirements, team meetings. We're here to help you. And I don't think I, I was so nerve wracked starting this program. Sorry, new computer. Um, I never introduced it my, myself. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <wow>. <laughs> and, sorry about that. But um, I can obviously help you with anything you need by contacting centerforselfgovernance.com. You can find us at info at TNC, info at tncsg.org. And my email address is mperkins at tncsg.org. Thank you so much. Everybody have a very nice evening. And don't forget to check your email tomorrow. This will all be downloaded with all the supplement information in your email accounts. And thanks again, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sina. <laughs>